our Facebook friends, those who are following us on Facebook that uh, uh, all around. Uh, thanks for being patient as we try to get started on time tonight, but we uh, just uh, trying to continue to work out our technical things. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, grab a Bible if you don't have one. We're going to look at Philippians, and uh, this is known as one of Paul's letters. It's written from prison, and uh, he set, many of Paul's letters are written from prison, which is kind of a unique thing. It gives you a different uh, uh, view of prison, mm -hmm. because if Paul hadn't been in prison, would he have taken the, had the time to write? Yeah. To write? Mm -hmm. Because when he wasn't in prison, he was running, <laughs> or hiding, or preaching. He didn't have much time. So it's almost a, a different kind of a blessing mm -hmm. that he had opportunity to write these wonderful letters that we still read today and find encouragement from. Mm -hmm. Real quick question. I'm sorry. To uh, was he allowed to do that, or did they ha all, or did you have to sneak it out? I, I no. He had a lot of freedom, and we found that last week when he was uh, when he went to Rome, he was he was definitely chained. He was under house arrest, right. but he had a lot of freedom to have visitors, and then he could write and read. And uh, Paul was a very intelligent guy, and and so he had a he had a pretty the equivalent of. Uh, an ankle bracelet, you know, mm -hmm. except it was it included a soldier <laughs> in the first century, and uh, so that was it, so he had a lot of freedom that normally they wouldn't have. But that partly became came because he was a Roman citizen. So if he hadn't been a Roman citizen, he wouldn't have had those rights. So he did have that that freedom to write, and again, he wouldn't have had the time. I don't think if he hadn't have been in prison. Right. So could prison, could we almost say prison was a good thing for Paul? I, I think that's one of the things that we're going to look at tonight because he writes this letter to Philippians. George? He made use of his opportunities. Yeah. Uh, was that ankle bracelet to his thorn in the flesh? That's a good guess. What was Luke doing all this time? Right? Yeah, where is Luke? Still in about two years and it, that, well, he, he did have a lot of company. He was allowed to have not just visitors, but to have people there with him. And uh, so we don't know the exact details, but we can get from the scriptures that he was often with with other people, that they, that they were coming and going fairly frequently and even hanging around. So And they were meeting his needs. And I don't know if you remember, but a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Paul and, how, and his imprisonment, that he... Uh, he he also he he paid some money to have more creature comforts. Right. I don't know if that meant you know he would pay and get uh, pen and ink, you know, or so that he could write write or room if, service probably room service <laughs> right <laughs> yeah right Roger it was room service and that's why he wrote with joy <laughs> right uh, uh, but he uh, even had uh, you know the uh, gentleman uh, Onesimus. You know, the right. uh, guy who had run away from his master Philemon, mm -hmm. actually go to, uh, you know, the jail or, or prison, post house arrest, and minister to him. So yes. you're right. He did have you know, a lot of uh, people coming by to actually see him. So we're going to look at Philippians. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 1, just some verses out of chapter 1, because it is known as one of the more joyful uh, letters. The letter of joy. And you find that word rejoice or joy several times within the book of Philippians. And you think, wow, it's it's just one that people love. You love to go and read Philippians. It's, it, you always feel good afterwards. There's It's just chock full of stuff that makes you feel good. But let's get a little bit of background because, first of all, we just said that Paul writes this from prison. Okay, He writes it from prison. Which means uh, we would we might say, well, that's a reason not to be joyful, but but Paul doesn't doesn't seem to, to fail from that. But uh, what we what I want us to look at is let's look back in Acts and see what happened when he first went to Philippi. I want you to have a little bit of background because I think that's important. Uh, why is he so happy, so joyful, so much in love with the town of Philippi. Alright, so what I'd like you to do is, is turn with me to uh, 
to the book of Acts, and we're going to look just at, uh, uh, in, we, we've seen this story before, and it's in Acts 16, and in Acts chapter 16, if you remember, Paul is on a journey, he's, uh, he's going around, he's sharing, he's starting churches, he's, he's doing great things, uh, in Acts chapter 16, he's, he's got Timothy with him, and Silas, uh, but he's, he gets a vision from a person uh, that a Macedonian mm -hmm. and he has this vision and, the, and it says come to Macedonia and it's a it's a urging from the Lord basically to go to Macedonia uh, in that in our day to the Europe Asia area where he's going to go outside of his comfort zone outside of the the nation of Israel into what we would see as Europe today so in, in chapter 16, he does that, okay, and uh, when he goes into uh, Macedonia, he, he, he sets sail from Troas, and he makes a direct voyage, uh, it says there in verse 11, or verse 12, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We remained in this city, I'm reading out of uh, Acts chapter 16 verse 13 and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposed where we supposed there was a place of prayer <clears throat> and and spoke to some women who had come together now I want to say this he's in Philippi this is his very first encounter with the city of Philippi he goes to Philippi on the sin what does Paul do on the Sabbath wherever he is Goes to the synagogue. Goes to the synagogue. All right. Here, he doesn't do that. Why not? Why doesn't he do that? Why does he go to the riverside? There's no synagogue. Otherwise, we know Paul would be there. He has set the pattern. That is what he's done everywhere. So we can assume that in Philippi, in this European place, there are some Jews, but not enough that would form a synagogue. It's a Roman colony, Roman city. It's a Roman city, exactly, George. It's a Roman city, Roman colony. So uh, the the law has it, and it's uh, you know kind of the uh, the policy back in the day in the first century that in a town uh, you had to have a minimum of what was it, Pastor Daniel? Yeah. Ten, right? Ten Jewish families in order to have a synagogue. If you didn't have ten families, you didn't have a synagogue. If you had ten families, you had a synagogue. There wasn't a synagogue here. So, there's not ten families. Okay? So, he's really out of his element. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, he, there's not even enough people to have a synagogue. So, he goes down to the riverside because this is also a custom. All right? It's a, it's a custom. He, he's not just randomly going to the river. It, that Where, if there is no synagogue, people of faith would go and gather by the river. Okay? To pray. So let's take a chance, he says to his uh, compadres in the, in the mission. Let's go down to the riverside. There's no synagogue here. Let's go to the riverside. And they find a group of women that are gathered there for prayer. Okay? And one of those women, and I'm not going to read the whole story because we want to get to Philippians, but the, one of those women is Lydia, who is the... Uh, the person who did uh, purple cloth that was kind of her business and uh, she becomes in that in this this moment she's the first one that meets Paul Paul shares with her and basically she becomes the first person to receive Christ and to be a believer in Europe Amen. all right mm -hmm. so she this is that she is something special this is this is a special moment in Philippi <laughs> you know it's um, it's <laughs> We could say, it, you know, whenever there's a first of anything, it, it, it's a special thing. You know, you always remember, you know, uh, your, your first kiss or your first date or, you know, your first anniversary. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't remember my first birthday, but I'm sure it was great. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> they, you know, you remember, it's a special thing. Well, this is very special because here in Philippi, in Europe, outside of the boundaries of what the, where the church has expanded so far, this is the first convert. So I'm, I'm telling you that because when he writes to Philippi, 
and he says, and he writes with such love and tenderness. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, it's his first town. It's his first city that he goes to outside of the realm of the Jewish sector. Okay? So there, there's your stage set. Now, what else happened on that trip? If you're looking at mm -hmm. Acts chapter 16, okay. it's... What? The servant girl, right? There was a servant girl, mm -hmm. correct, right? There's a servant girl who, when she she was prophesying and yeah. saying and, and kind of identifying Paul and them and saying, oh, these guys are the prophets of the Almighty God, the, you know, the followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what did Paul do? <laughs> he, she annoyed him so much, and that's basically what it says, that he freed her from that spirit. Well, Unfortunately for Paul, or fortunately, um, that took away the, the means of making money to the people who own that slave girl. So what happened to Paul? This is just days after talking to Lydia. He goes to jail. After, but before he goes to jail even, they beat him within an inch of his life. Him and Silas. They arrest him beat them, flog them, it says viciously flog them. And this is still in Acts chapter 16. Mm -hmm. Viciously flog them and then put them in jail. But not just jail, okay? This is Philippi now. This is the church. This is the city that we're going to read about how much he loves them, all right? But what happened here? That when he not only put him in, in jail, but it says that they beat them with rods mm -hmm. and then they inflicted many blows upon them. They threw them into prison ordering the jail jailer to keep them safely. And he put them, so in order to do that, the jailer put them into the inner prison mm -hmm. and fastened their feet in the stocks. Okay, they just beat them within an inch of their life. Isn't it enough to throw these guys in jail? No, it's not enough. They not only throw them in jail, they put them in the inner prison. And back in the first century, and we shared this before in a couple Bible studies, and that is the inner prison is just a big hole in the ground. Okay? You're in the prison, which is bad enough. You're just sitting in your own filth. You're chained up. You can't do anything. You're bleeding. You're uh, open wounds. But they put them down into the hole. Him and Silas. Now, remember what happened? I know this is just your earthquake. Well, before the earthquake. Oh, they were singing hymns. They were singing hymns. What? The Apostle Paul and Silas, beaten within an inch of their life, put now into the worst human condition possible. It's pitch dark, and they start singing hymns. Wow. What, what hymns were they singing? I mean, what, what is that, you know? I don't know. Praising God. Praising God. <laughs> So much so, it uh, then then there right there was an earthquake. You correct. There's an earthquake, and what happened when that earthquake came? All the shackles. It said their feet were in the stocks. Their feet now are free, out of the stocks. All the other prisoners, all their chains fall off because there's a jail full of people. All right, and the doors open. And the doors open. All right. Now the earthquake woke up the sleeping guard. I don't know if he was sleeping or not, but they, he got his attention, and he come running in, okay, and he saw all the open doors and all the empty chains. Well, penalty, if you're a guard and the prisoners escape, is death. Okay? But when he looked around and he couldn't see anybody, why? Because not everybody didn't leave the jail. They went over to the hole. The prisoners who were set free did not leave. They went further into the prison. Now, I want you to hear that because that is strange. If you don't think that's strange, I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> These guys are set free. Should have bolted for their lives, man. Yeah. But they, <laughs> but instead of bolting for their lives, they go exactly. further into the prison. Right. Why? Hmm. To talk to Paul and Silas. Why, Roger? Why would they want to go and talk to these Looney Tunes that are down in the hole singing? They were wanted to find out why they were 
<laughs> yeah. And then I'm praying. So what's going on with these guys? Yeah. You know, man, I mean, we got this earthquake. Everybody is scared. There's you no know, lights all out. And then they go to these guys. There's something that must, you know, must have, you know, driven them to go and see them. <laughs> well, it also says when they were praying and singing, the other prisoners were all listening to them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Got to be wondering what's going on. Yeah. Now, that's, you need to bookmark that in hmm. your brain. Yeah. Jesus. When we read Philippians, you need to bookmark that in your brain. Mm. That Philippi, Paul is going to say in Philippians chapter 1, mm -hmm. every time I think of Philippi, I think of, and then what's he going to say? He's not going to say, I think of how you guys beat the daylights mm. out of me. And then, No. I'm thinking about how I was in prison and I, I almost died. Mm. No, that's not what he said. He says, every time I think about you, mm. I remember you with joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the prisoners go in. Mm. The jailer comes in. He's going to kill himself. Because mm. might as well do it, because he's going to get killed by somebody else. I might as well do it myself. He yeah. starts to kill himself, and he hears Paul's voice. Paul says, no, don't kill yourself. Do that. Why? And I want you to hear what Paul says. We're all here. All of us. Amen. You didn't lose anybody. Mm. That's how we know the prisoners came in. Yep. That's that's how we know Absolutely. that they didn't leave. We're all here. Mm. And the jailer doesn't go around and lock them all back up. No. He falls down on his knees no. what must I do? and says, what, what must I do to be saved? You know, it's really interesting because when you, as you were going through this uh, narrative here, you know, in verse 29, he called for lights. So he wanted to make sure <laughs> yeah. that everybody's there because, yeah. you know, the earthquake is kind of pitch dark now. So he called for lights. And, yeah. But yeah, we're all here. Nobody's gone. And I think that was something to him. Man, why didn't guys, you leave? Why didn't you leave? You know, There's something supernatural going on. God here. is moving. Yeah. This is not. Yeah. This is not normal. No. <laughs> Just like we said, it, yeah. that's why we have to understand how strange this is. Yeah. You know, sometimes, sometimes when we're reading the scriptures and we see a miracle like this, we forget because mm -hmm. we're reading this Bible. We're going, oh yeah, it was incredible. All saints singing in the jail. Mm -hmm. That you know doesn't leave in the jail. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. This is weird. It's so weird that it tried and true soldier falls to his knees. This is not of this world. No. Now, I want you to hear that because, because the whole premise, Paul is in prison when he writes the letter to the Philippians. Okay? He's in prison. Again, just like he was in jail in Philippi. And the prison, he's writing to them to say, this, listen, this is, I got something to share with you. There's joy amidst the suffering. Mm -hmm. All right? And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And so I want us to get to it, but I had to remind you. And by the way, by the way, so the jailer takes Paul and Silas, takes him home, washes up his wounds. Now, this is all happening all night long. It was a long night. Nobody slept. It's an all-night revival I talk about. All right? They, he goes, he, he takes him home, washes his wounds. The jailer gives his life to Christ. His whole family gives his life to Christ. And they're baptized. All before sunrise. This is all night long. Nobody sleeps. Then, the next morning, they come, and we have the record that they came to get Paul out of jail. All right, and they came. Everybody's there in the jail, which tells us after the jailer gave his life to Christ and his whole family gave his life to Christ, I would think he'd set them free, get out of town, but he didn't. He took them back because what would happen if they came the next morning and found that all the prisoners were gone? They'd kill the jailer. <laughs> And probably his family. Okay. But Paul probably said, you, you have to obey your master. You got to. Go we don't have that written down, but come on, Dennis. Yeah, exactly. It has to be true. It has to be true that he, he took him back, put him back in prison, right there, all the people, 
chain them all back up. They all did it voluntarily. And then they came, and the story goes on. The jailer lives, and hence we have the beginning, the spark of the fire in Philippi. The revival. It starts with a, a lady down by the river named Lydia, a jailer who doesn't, hit, you know, he's not even Jewish, and, and who knows how many of those prisoners. Yeah, and his family. And his family. And that, so we have a little revival happening. And then, then Paul leaves that tent. And now he's writing back from a jail right. or from prison uh, in, uh, in Rome. He's writing this. It's really interesting because uh, in Acts 16 and verse 34, and it's good that like, you went through this. You know, If you look at this word joy that we are going to uh, you know, look at mm -hmm. and learn more in Philippi, I mean the letter to the Philippians, Actually, the beginning is right here in this story. In verse 34, the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and then look at what follows. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Mm -hmm. So this is really the genesis, the beginning of the joy that we're going to see really filling this whole book and even with Paul. Because even in the midst of that kind of suffering and all the things that could have gone wrong, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God turned things around and there's joy. Joy with Paul, joy with the jailer. You know, there's joy everywhere. It's incredible. It is. And uh, <laughs> and this is also, it was when he was being released from Philippi that right. he makes the appeal for right. to go to Caesar. Right. To, and so he begins, really, the trek to Rome from from Philippi. So Philippi, Philippi is very important to right. Paul. And, uh, and so let's go to Philippians, and let's just, I want to just read, start, uh, I told you a few of the verses, how he talks about remembering them with joy, and, and, and uh, talks about being imprisoned and everything, but, but that he, uh, Christ is not imprisoned. And then in verse 12 of chapter 1 in Philippians, just look at your Bibles. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, what, what has happened to him? Oh, he's been he's been beaten. He's been uh, you know they they uh, tried to execute him by stoning him. They uh, chased him out of towns. They laughed at him. They beat him up. It, you know so, so many things. But he says this is all served to advance the gospel, mm -hmm. so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard wow. and all the rest and and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, I, I love that because what we find here is that is that uh, that uh, th this is Paul sees his imprisonment and all this suffering as an opportunity and an inspiration to others to preach the gospel. Now, if you think about that as well, you might think, well, that makes sense. Does it really make sense? Because I think that might keep people from preaching the gospel. If they know you preach the gospel, you're going to go to jail. If you preach the gospel, you're going to get beaten. You preach the gospel, and you might even be executed. But Paul says, you know what? Me doing this, living this life, and, and, and the things that are happening to me serve to advance the gospel. And he says, even the whole imperial guard. Well, think about it. If he hadn't been imprisoned and chained to these guards, if he hadn't have been in jail, that jailer would have never found the Lord or his family. And if he hadn't been uh, in jail or imprisoned in Rome, all the imperial guard wouldn't know. But they're all getting to know. You know, it's your turn to be chained to Paul. Oh, are you kidding me? I got to be chained to Paul. Ah, he's bugging me. I'm this close. I'm telling you. You know. And they just go through. I, you know, they probably draw straws. Who's going to guard Paul today? I don't know. Oh, I got the short straw. You know, and Paul's going to preach to him. He's going to share him the gospel because that's what he does. And the whole imperial guard gets to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The imperial guard are the ones that assassinated Nero. Yeah. And they also take care of the emperor because that's the imperial guard is really 
Yeah, Nero was the emperor. Yeah. 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 In fact, Nero is the mm -hmm. one who's responsible for the execution of Paul, mm -hmm. the his final execution. Mm -hmm. But who, how many of the imperial guard were now believers and 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 came to help depose Nero in that mm -hmm. certain situation wow. and and even uh, and save the lives of many other Christians on on that behalf. But what I want you to see is he sees his suffering, he sees this prison and being imprisoned as an advancing of the gospel of Christ. Well, I, I, I like this, this statement, is that God did not use Paul despite his prison sentence. God, or despite his sufferings, God used Paul through and used his sufferings to advance the gospel. God used it. God, God is God. He's sovereign. So when we suffer and when we have circumstances that are difficult, okay, he, he can, as we said in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you know, he works even the, the things that we think of as suffering, he works it to our good and to his glory. And Paul would have never had it any other way. As he looks back, he sees how God uses his suffering. And, uh, you know, here, here's, here's a, just an easy illustration, and, and that is uh, that when, when it's the darkest is when you see the light the brightest. You know, I have a, when you do the key fob on my uh, truck, I hit the key fob, and I, I, I love it. At night, you know, I go out, and I want to know if my car is going to, my truck's going to unlock. I hit the unlock button, and the light blinks. Mm -hmm. And I know that it unlocked mm -hmm. because the light blinked. But in the daytime, I can't see the light blinking. So I'll go up and hit it like five times, but it's already unlocked. The light blinked, but I couldn't see it because it's light out. But when it's dark, it lights up the night. Well, isn't aren't we called to be the light of the world? And when does the light shine the brightest? For Paul, he's saying, light shines the brightest in the dark. What... If they were singing and praising God in Philippi out in the street, okay, some wacky guys, you know, here's some more revival guys, here's some more preachers, here's some more prophets. But in the hole, in the inner prison, in the dark, in the middle of the night, they sing. And a light shines bright. And all of a sudden, that what they wouldn't, what people more, might not see and might not notice, it, they notice it now because who sings when they're in the hole you see anybody can sing out on the street so as we do, and Daniel's going to walk us through a few more of these verses because th this is so incredible as he talks to the Philippians after the fact from Rome and, but, but think about your situation think about when we suffer and how we feel we don't feel like oh this is my opportunity to shine I'm suffering I'm, I'm having a bad day. Here, you know, things are going bad. Oh, God's going to shine. We don't do that, do we? Okay. So now your minds, your wheels are turning. Okay. Somehow God allows us to, sometimes God allows it to get dark in our lives so that his light can shine even brighter. How do we do that, Daniel? And I don't think Paul really, you know, I mean, I'm not in his mind, but we can see the results, but clearly nobody wants to suffer. Yeah. And I don't think when Paul was in that kind of dungeon, he was really enjoying himself. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. And I think we know that because, you know, he's beaten. And uh, Pastor Mike, you're right. When we, uh, we read this last week, when you go to Second you know, Corinthians chapter 11, you notice all the things he had to endure. Mm -hmm. But you're right when you say that even in the midst of the suffering, God used it for something. Mm -hmm. That was for God's glory. And I think that's you know, the, the, the real power of the suffering that he had to go through. And so that's, I think, is something we can take. And I think when we, we continue from what you just uh, explained, we also see that uh, Paul is actually exalting Christ in a situation where he's confronted with two kind of situations. One is, and this is where I take the cue that he wasn't really enjoying what he was going through. At some point he says, maybe it's good for me to die. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, he was thinking about that, you know, and I think um, I remember a story that actually was true. My, my grandma, uh, blessed memory, you know, she was old and she was always saying, I want to die, I want to die, you know, you know death back home. And my, my, my brother, very mischievous, went up to grandma's ceiling and put a little ball up on the kind of, you know, one of the beams there. And grandma was lying in bed, you know, poor grandma, and my brother, I don't know what he did, he shook something and then the tent fell on grandma, and grandma called out to everybody, come help, I'm, you know, something is happening. And then my brother turns around and said, but grandma, I thought you said you wanted to die. <laughs> grandma, are you scared of death? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of funny, but nobody wants to die. Let's put it that way. But here in this situation, just let me read from verse 18, uh, where Pastor Mike uh, ended, verse 18 of chapter 1, and see Paul's you know, dilemma caught in between it. And, you know, either death or life, Paul obviously was still in the business of doing the work of the kingdom. But which of them did he prefer? Well, let's see. So in uh, verse 18 of chapter 1, uh, this is what Paul is saying. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. In other words, the gospel is being preached mm -hmm. and, you know, our souls are being won for the kingdom. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Again, something very important. Paul is not, you know, again, you know, uh, scared to go through this. And I, as I said, I don't know what was going through his mind. But at some point, he's going to ask, is this really something I need to go through? So let's see what, what, what happens in verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. So whether I'm dead or alive, whichever situation that I find myself in, that Christ will be exalted. And I think this is really, really important. Then verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We're going to find out some very tests, very you know, powerful, profound statements that he makes here. Well, to live is, for me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. So if I'm alive, for Christ. Because it gives me the opportunity to spread the gospel. But if I die, I go to be with the Lord. And that's okay. And then he goes on. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. For I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ. Which is far, which is better by far. Verse 24. But if... But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. And so, some people read this and they ask, was Paul really seeking to die? Well, I don't see that. Paul is saying, either way, whether I am alive or dead, it's all for the gospel, I mean, for the glory of the gospel and for the glory, you know, of God. You know, I can see here that, you know, living for Christ in this life is not living for ourselves. We're living for Christ to do the work that he's called us, you know, to do. And if we are called by Christ, again, we are called to glory to be with him. And so for Paul, either way, there's no problem. If I'm alive, it's all good because through me, the gospel will advance. But if I'm dead, I know that God is going to raise up people to actually continue and I will be with the Lord in glory. I think Paul had come to a point in his life where we're going to hear at the end of this letter that I've fought the good fight. Mm -hmm. I've run the race. Everything is good. Now, what is laid out for me is that crown of righteousness. I think what he's trying to convey to us here is that in the gospel that we have found ourselves in, we just have to allow God to use us the way God wants to use us. Whether alive 
or when you know whether he calls us you know, to be with him. And I've been thinking about you know some of these uh, things that we read about Paul and what he's doing. And uh, as I was reading about this, my mind went to uh, a passage in the book of Psalms, Psalm 30 and verse 5. Well, let me actually read from verse 4. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but joy or rejoicing comes in the morning. You know, as I was preparing for this, uh, one of the authors actually did something that was you know, quite interesting. And he said, you know, the way that we, you know, kind of uh, suffering is morning tomorrow. And then he's saying, but there is joy that comes in the morning. And so, if you look at what's going on here, if you take the you out of here, which is us, and I thought that was neat. From morning, we get morning. No, I hope you can hear my accent here. So, morn to morn is to weep. You take this out, it all becomes, you know, so there is joy. In a way, we have, you know, the joy of, of Christ. And, and somebody also said even the word joy stands for Jesus, others, and then you. And so really, joy in its true meaning means putting Jesus first, putting others, and then you actually go last. I thought it's really beautiful. And so you can see why Paul was so hung up on this, that I'm joyful no matter what happens. Because to be with Christ is really what matters. Christ here in this life, because if Christ wants me to preach the gospel, he will keep me and I'm going to preach the gospel. If he calls me, it's okay, but my joy in him is always there because I put him first. I put others and then, you know, before myself. And I think this is really something that we can take with us as we think about what Paul had to go through. And so let me throw this question at all of us. What are some of our greatest challenges to living in joy? To be joyful in the Lord. What are some of the challenges that we have to maybe go through or put aside to really have joy in the Lord? What are some of the challenges in our, in our lives? Sickness. Sickness? Death of friends. Yep, yes. Yeah, not, not just our own deaths, but yeah. the deaths of I mean, others yes. that we love. Yeah. These are all challenges. But when we know the Lord, we know that this is not the end. Morning, the you would, it would go away. And we know that, you know, in the end, it's going to be joyful because God is going to come and take us to be with him. It is a very powerful illustration of what Paul is doing. And then finally, Paul tells us, you know, something about what happens to him. Uh, let me just jump to verse 27, uh, to verse 30, and then you can chime in with your observations. Whatever happens, so here is Paul. He's now telling, you know, the believers in Philippi why it's so important to put Christ first and others before themselves. And so he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let's stop here. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Why is that important? Why is he making that statement? Why is he telling them that whatever the situation, whatever the circumstances, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why is he saying that? What do you think? Witnesses to others. And that's a good point, to be a witness. And that's exactly what Paul is asking them to do. To actually witness to the gospel of Christ. And to be a witness is precisely what Paul is doing. Because as Pastor Mike said, you know, as he went to Philippi, look at all the situations and everything. What was he? He was a witness to the jailer, to all those around, and, you know, his fellow you know, prisoners. He was a witness. And that's, he, that's exactly what he's telling the church in Philippi. Whatever happens, be the kind of witness that God has called you to be. And so the good news is this. 
we are not the only witnesses. Because in Matthew 28, Jesus tells them, but let me read to you uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. And I think that is something that should help us to really take our witnessing seriously as Paul did. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, a verse which we all know very well. Hebrews 12, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, including the apostle Paul, mm -hmm. what should we do? Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. And I like what comes after that. Fixing our eyes on who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are called to be witnesses. No matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, to be witnesses of Christ is really what matters. And that's precisely what Paul did. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I think that uh, it's just important to realize two, two things. First of all, that, uh, that we have a responsibility. Yeah. That, you know, in other words, conduct yourself. That means, you know, sometimes we feel like because our salvation came to us with by the free gift of God, that that we don't have to do anything. We're just waiting for God to bail us out or to do to be our witness. But we are called to conduct ourselves accordingly. And looking at Paul and his suffering should inspire us and we and help us to to be able to say you know if i if paul can do it i can do it you know what i mean we should also get inspiration from paul like others were getting in the first century yeah, our, John? our primary job our only job really is to glorify god yeah and so no matter how it, it falls down how you go about doing it mm -hmm. it all comes back to glorifying god that's our our only responsibility, really, is to glorify God. Right. Right. Now, wasn't that what, you know, how Paul lived his life? Mm -hmm. Even in, in that situation, in, in prison, in chains, you know, he was still allowing God to use him to bring glory to him. But I got to confess, Pastor Daniel, that when things go bad, <laughs> I, I, I don't usually sing hymns. No. <laughs> but, I don't either. but, but I should thank you thank you John I should because you know how many the cloud of witnesses I'm glad you read that out of yeah. Hebrews because how many people gone before us and they, they sacrificed their lives they suffered for that you know I mean there's so many stories in that, not just in the Bible but even through recent history where, where Christians have, have given their lives to in order to preach the gospel they they've been given the uh, uh, the ultimatum of you either recant mm -hmm. your beliefs mm -hmm. and reject your faith or you will die mm -hmm. or you will be imprisoned or you will be tortured mm -hmm. and they have stood up and said I will not mm -hmm. I will not recant some of the students in Columbine yeah. yeah they will they will not they would not reject their faith and 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 they they had made the decision. What's the price? What's the price? It's worth that. And and when we that kind of passion for Christ, where Paul can say, it doesn't matter whether I live or die. You can kill me, but that's not gonna stop the gospel. And I'm not gonna stop preaching. How many times did we hear the apostles? <laughs> Peter said, hey, you know what? If we're on trial here today, in Acts chapter 4, if we're on trial here today because, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want you to know we're, we're still going to. Yeah. We're going to preach. You, can't, we're, you can tell us to stop, but we're not going to stop. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep preaching. Well, if you keep preaching, we'll throw you in jail. Oh, you can throw me in jail, but I'm not going to stop preaching. Mm -hmm. You know? Where's that kind of passion? Where's that kind of commitment to our faith that needs to be here today? I mean, most of us, you don't have to threaten me to go to jail. You can just threaten to make fun of me. Mm -hmm. You can just threaten to, you know, cut my pay. Mm -hmm. Don't give me that promotion. Right. Or or give me a mean look. Exactly. And that'll shut me up. You don't even have to try to beat me up. You know? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We and, and we whine and cry about how terrible it is for us. 
what, really? Because we're really not living out there on the edge and mm-hmm. saying, you know what? It doesn't matter what the world says. Right. It doesn't matter what government you're under. It doesn't matter what country you live in. It doesn't matter how much persecution you have. You know what? We are truly blessed. Mm-hmm. And tomorrow we celebrate the 4th of July, which talks about the independence of our country. It's a great country. I, I have no, nothing, again, I know we are blessed beyond belief with the freedoms we have. But we take them for granted. And we, in the freest country on the face of the earth, have refused to take advantage of our freedoms. And, and I, you know, that's just my opinion. I want, it makes me want to take advantage of the blessings that God has given us in the place where we are to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that we can. You know, so, Pastor, but I, about Paul, I mean, we know that God wanted him to stay there because he confronted all those people. But it, I mean, so he did the right thing. How would he know? My selfish human mind would say, I'm ashamed. Okay, my chain's over. I'm going to run, and I can teach the gospel to wherever I run to. So, you know, how do we, I guess, how do we make the right decision on, on yeah. in these I I mean, I think the the, the simple answer is really what Paul is saying here in this very letter. Um, In fact, uh, in verse 29 or in verse 30, which is kind of the last verses of chapter 1 that we're supposed to study, it says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now that I still have. So to answer your question, there's something that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, nobody, our experiences will be different. And so the way you will relate to that question will be, you know, based on how you, you know, relate to, you know, the gospel and of course what God is doing in, in, in your life. Because there, yeah. there were times when Paul did hide. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And times that he did uh, go away from a city. Here in this particular case, in the t- town of Philippi, like during the Philippian experience, when the jailer, uh, you can kind of see how it might honor God more if you didn't run, mm-hmm. and, yeah. because that then you would have been, you would have made sure the execution of that of that jailer and everybody, and and people, but but by doing it the way he did, look what happened, right. you know. So yeah. he was he was following the lead of the Spirit, and of course. Right before that happened, he was following the lead of the Spirit to even go to Philippi. So yeah. he knew he was supposed to be there. And then, well, I'm now I'm going to jail. I, you know, like you said, Daniel, he wasn't enjoying that necessarily. But he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of his faith. So then he's singing, what's going to happen? Chains fall off. Does he, does he get up and leave? You know what, Ray? He might not have been able to get up and leave. Because mm-hmm. remember, they beat him with rods yeah. until they almost died. Yeah. They, they, chains fell off. He's probably thinking, these chains aren't keeping me here. I can't move. Mm-hmm. You know? But then again, if the chains fell off like that, God probably gave him enough strength to get up. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't get out. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, so they they just get baptized him and came back. Yeah, and yeah. was fed <laughs> also. I was really, I'm sure yeah. dressed him up and fed him well. You know. <laughs> that was good. Good. It, I, you know, I think every situation we have to listen to the Holy He's Spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Absolutely. keep praying. And, you know, sometimes God will want us to, to leave and take advantage of yeah. that freedom. And sometimes God wants us to be right. witnesses. But, but always, what he says here, and I, I like what you said in verse 27, mm-hmm. Always conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel Amen. of Christ. Amen. So, here, this was what it was in in when, in yeah. Philippi. Right. Now, of course, when he's writing the letter to the Philippians, he's in jail in That's Rome. Right. And for following when Jesus, to follow Jesus, Jesus, when they came to get him, they let him. He said, "All right." I mean, he just went. Yeah. He was God. He didn't have to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. That's the fact right. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So he knew it was his time. Remember. Yeah. I get that, you know, when he was going to, I think he was going into Asia where he received the Macedonian vision. Yeah. Right. His path was going there. So when he received the vision, of course, he obeyed. But I'm just wondering if the vision came with all the details of him getting beat. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm I always sure wondered if he would have said, can I still go to <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, unfortunately for most of us, God reveals to us on a need-to-know basis. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And Paul probably didn't need to know that. No, <laughs> but because if we knew what was going to happen to us, we would probably change directions ourselves. So sometimes, isn't it better for God not to tell us? And but I think during Paul's conversion experience, Jesus showed him what he was going to suffer. That he was, yeah. Him, mm -hmm. That he was going to have to go through all this stuff. But he also showed him what the reward was going to be. Yeah. yeah. Serving is not greater than the master, as you have said so many times during the Wednesday night Bible study. Right. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Jesus and Jesus did the same thing. Okay, well, I think we should uh, go ahead and finish our time. I appreciate that, Pastor Daniel, going through the rest of that chapter. The whole letter of Philippians is filled with joy and promises. Re you should read it. It take you, take you uh, 15, 20 minutes tonight to read through the, the whole book and just get just feel refreshed. And uh, <laughs> well, let's uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for this letter that Paul has written in a spirit of joy and we pray that it would continue to inspire us not only to have joy but to have joy even amidst the suffering and to cling to our faith and to continue to proclaim the gospel even when our circumstances would drag us down and discourage us may we shine the light even brighter when the light when when, when the circumstances are dark may we shine your light even brighter father we will give you all the glory and all the praise go with us now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.